This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Darkness and light have more meaning in the Bible than you might think. Joe Kovacs reveals the amazing power of the Almighty's Word to illustrate the secrets of life and death, punishment and eternal life, and spirit versus flesh using a Godspeed understanding of how to read the Scriptures. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live! Well, the week is finally done. Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. This is the fourth and final episode of a series I hope has been eye-opening and thought-provoking for you. It has been for me. It's based on Joe Kovacs' new book, Reaching God Speed, which explores the concept that Yehovah embeds his message in everything around us, like everything at all times, and even through people who don't believe he exists. Well, he did it with Pharaoh, right? So why can't he just do it through anyone? So it's very interesting stuff. Uh, we'll get into that in just a minute, but first, let's take a look at the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. We are on the third Shabbat of the third month, also known as Savan, and uh, the Feast of Shavuot is behind us now, and we are looking toward the summer. And with the summer comes an opportunity to, you know, relax and maybe rekindle your relationship with Yehovah in maybe another level. So let's talk about summer with our Ambassador Club coordinator, Angie Clark. Welcome. Hello, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So yes, summer's coming, lots of fun stuff, and you know what? Our ambassadors are fun people. Yes, we, they are. We, yeah, we've been talking about them for a couple of weeks now, how uh, these folks, uh, first of all, they're the ones that support the ministry with a gift of at least $100 a month, right. every month. Uh, they, they don't ask for anything in return, and so that's just a beautiful thing. So thank you, first of all, to our ambassadors. But these folks are really creative people. You oh know, my gosh, yes. You know, Josh Tolley always talks about whenever we have him here, he's always quick to point out, you know what? As believers, we're the ones that's supposed to be the entrepreneurs. We're Absolutely. supposed to be the leaders. We are the head, not the tail. So realize your calling, listen to Yehovah, and do something. Right. And so that's a great call. I mean, I've, I've done that in my own life, which is I'm very grateful to Josh for pushing me in that direction. So there's lots of ambassadors who are like that too. And one that we really wanna talk about, especially when it comes to summer and vacationing, is, is a place that one of our ambassadors has created that I wanna go to. I know, me and it's, too. It's in Texas. Now you have relatives in Texas. I don't have any relatives. Well, I got relatives in Arkansas. I could guess, I guess sweep down to Texas, I guess. But this place is in Texas. Yes, Uvalde, and, Texas. Yes, and it's called uh, Chalk Bluff River Resort. Yes. And you can go to chalkbluffriverresort.com. Now we don't normally do this, but I wanna I want show you this cool place. So there's, there's the uh, information on the bottom of the screen. And it's neat because it's great for the whole family. Right. So first of all, camping. Right. So if you're looking for a place for, you know, Sukkot or something like that, well, mm -hmm. great. You know, and in fact, we actually looked at this place for an event with the Rude Awakening. It never panned out, but we were, we were looking at this place. Right, right. And it's just beautiful. I mean, and Mary and Samantha, yes. they want people to come. They want believers to come and you'll be well taken care of. Yep. Now, we actually asked their permission if we could do this. Yes. Are they getting thing, anything from us? No, no, they're not getting paid for this. We just said, hey, you know what? We think your place is really cool. Can we put it on Shabbat Night Live? And they said, yes, sure, go ahead. Because there's always people looking for an, a, a place to vacation. Yeah. And this would be great. It's cool. So they've got, uh, I went on the website, they've got camping. As far as I can tell, this, you got, there's probably a lot more there, but there, there's camping, there's there's an exotic animal petting zoo. So yeah. they have like sloths and like giraffes. giraffes. What, at first I went on the website and I thought that maybe one of them was on, I didn't, well, I went on their Facebook page and I thought that, oh, they went on a vacation somewhere and they're holding a sloth and, a, and then I'm seeing a giraffe. And I'm seeing little kids, and I'm like, well, you don't usually bring little kids on a, on a safari, so right. where is this? <laughs> and it's in Texas. <laughs> right, it's right right here at home. Yeah, and so now, you said, what is the name of the place again? Chalk Bluff. River, oh no, I mean the, the town where it's near. Oh, Uvalde. Uvalde, okay, great. So I didn't know how to pronounce that, but I, if, as far as I can tell, it's about 90 minutes west of San Antonio. Right. So it's along that same route. But yeah, very interesting stuff. They've got a beautiful river there. They've got cliffs, just 
crystal clear water. And, and they're believers. They're yeah. Torah observant believers. And so, and now this is, that's especially what I wanted to bring out. So if you look at, um, for example, different cultures. So the, the, the Muslim culture, you know, they look after themselves. You know, if their right. brother owns a business or something like that, they'll go to their brother's business before they go somewhere else. That's so if right. You're, family, you know, family helps family out. Family first, right? So mm-hmm. if, the, if, if you're a Muslim and you have a, a Muslim plumber, well, you go to the Muslim plumber before you call uh, a Gentile. Doctor, you know? whatever. Same thing. Mm-hmm. And, and the, and the, and the uh, Jewish congregations do the same thing. Right. They support their, their community first. And then they look outside if they can't find anybody. Well, we should do the same thing. I agree. We as, be- as believers in Yeshua, why don't we do this? This is ridiculous. I, I mean, it's it said that in a Jewish culture, uh, a dollar passes between six people within the community before it heads out. Right. And we need to do that same thing. Oh, I so agree. Right. I agree. And so, and with ambassador club members like this, and everybody, every not just ambassador club members, but all believers, especially those who are getting serious about their faith who look into the Torah and know there's more out there. Yeah. They also look into, you know, usually those are the same people that look into their health. They look into, well, what, how can I support myself with a business? And they're more serious about life in general. Right, right. And, and taking life by, by, the, uh, by the horns. By the horns, yeah. thank you, yeah. That's one of the good things about our Ambassador Club Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just for ambassadors, you know. A lot of people try to come and get on, but I'm sorry for declining you, but you know, you have to be an ambassador first. But there's been so many people that have met each other just from that Facebook page. For instance, um, a lot of our ambassadors, they operate in the gifts of Yehovah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it's a place for family to pray for each other. Uh, we really reach out in the community to help uh, get people through this. Well, one of our um, our partners, um, Stephanie is her name. She operates in the gift of um, deliverance. Mm. And so one of our partners was really needing prayer for their son. And I, you know, I'm trying to connect them. I said, listen, she's got a gift that you could probably use that your, your son could probably benefit from. So that's just, that's how we operate. You know, we are truly a family in a community. Mm. So that's why we talk about Mary. That's why we talk yeah. about Roger. That's, you know, about these people. Very cool people, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they support the ministry. And if you want to support the ministry too, and you're not quite ready for the Ambassador Club, that's okay. Yeah. We have other things you can do. Like for this example, this is uh, June's Love Gift. This is and a it's very- two separate programs. Two separate programs, yes, exactly. Make that- yeah. Clear. Yes, thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. So the Ambassador Club is uh, every month. You can talk to Angie uh, about that and how to get in on that. And if you want to do the love gift, you just go to monthlylovegift.com and you can get this thing here. This is a special teaching from uh, Dr. Douglas Hamp called Gog and Magog, what that really means and how it ties into the end times. I think Doug's right on. I think he's got something really special I do here. Too. You need to get that teaching. So that's for a gift of $50 or more. You're not buying the teaching, you're supporting the ministry. We want to say thanks. Have this. And also for a gift of $100 or more, you'll get this and Michael Rood's favorite pillow. This is, <laughs> <laughs> now Michael, Michael Rood says, he was he joked about this uh, on Passover or something yeah. like that, I think he said, and he said, I'm Michael Rood and this is my pillow. This is not a my pillow pillow, okay, just to make that clear. But it's Michael Rood's <laughs> favorite pillow and we decided, hey, you know what? Before it just looked like this, it was white. And we said, you know what? We need to put the name of Yehovah on this thing. Let's, let's just, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. So this is scanned directly from- it's comfortable. From, yeah. It's from the Aleppo Codex, Exodus 3.15, which says, this is my name forever, Yehovah. So you'll get this and the, pill, and the, uh, and the teaching for $100 or more, a gift. Again, just gifts to you. And if you want to give $300 or more, we'll also include these crystal salt and pepper shakers that say uh, Shabbat Kadosh on them. Beautiful, beautiful things. They are hefty little they suckers. They are very nice. Yeah, very, very beautiful things. And so uh, this will be your gift. gift too. Yes, for $300 or more and... That is our gift for June. There's only you know, a little bit of time left in June, so make sure you get it now, uh, because at the end of June, it will be gone. So, Angie, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. One more week. Can we have you one more week? Absolutely. All right, terrific. We'll see you then. All right, okay. Darkness and light have more meaning in the Bible than you might think. Joe Kovacs reveals the amazing power of the Almighty's Word to illustrate the secrets of life and death, punishment and eternal life, and spirit versus the flesh. So, it's the final episode of Godspeed. Now, Michael's up next with The Kidder Show. We'll see you in two minutes. Most believers, at one point or another, attempt to decipher the book of the Revelation. But without context, it's difficult to understand. This month, Michael Rood wants to give you a teaching that will make your Bible come alive and reveal the fascinating end-time truth of Yeshua's victory against the enemy of his people. What really is gonna happen is there's gonna be an epic battle when Yeshua comes 
He's going to fight against an individual named Gog, the Beast, Antichrist, the Little Horn, Son of Perdition. They're all the same thing. Dr. Douglas Hamp helps to unravel one of the most misunderstood events of the end times, Gog and Magog. This teaching is an exclusive thank you gift for your support of Arut Awakening International. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you Gog and Magog with Dr. Douglas Hamp on DVD or Blu-ray. Or donate $100 and we'll send you Gog and Magog. I'm Michael Root and this is my pillow. Plus, Michael Rood's favorite pillow, featuring the name of Yehovah, scanned from the Aleppo Codex. Or donate $300 and we'll send you Gog and Magog with Dr. Douglas Hamp. Michael Rood's favorite pillow, featuring the name of Yehovah. Plus, these elegant crystal salt and pepper shakers, featuring scenes from Jerusalem and the words Shabbat Kodesh in Hebrew. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. These special gift collections featuring the Gog and Magog teaching from Dr. Douglas Hamp are available only in June and supplies are limited. Call to make your donation today and receive these exclusive thank you gifts. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. On the morning that the Passover lambs were selected, there were two loaves that were put on the wall of the temple. When the first one was removed, after that, no more leavened bread was eaten. When the second loaf was removed, then all of the leavened bread in the land of Israel was then burned because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was going to commence at sunset that evening. The night before, Yeshua took artos. He took leavened bread and he blessed the Most High in the presence of his disciples and he interpreted the Kadosh Mikra, the holy rehearsal that Melchizedek put in place with Abraham. Yeshua said the prayer of the Melech Zadik, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Homotzi Lechem Haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he said, this represents my body, which is now broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Then Yeshua took the cup and he said, Baruch Atah, Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, the King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then he said, you take my cup, divide it among yourselves. I will not drink a sip of the fruit of the vine till I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So as often as we do this now, we rehearse not only his death, but we rehearse that we will be at the marriage supper of the lamb and at the marriage supper of the lamb, he will take his cup and say, Lahaim to life everlasting. And until then, Shabbat Shalom. Well, if you have been with us for the last few weeks, we've been talking with Joe Kovacs about his book, Reaching God's Speed. And the subtitle of that is Unlocking the Secret Broadcast, Revealing the Mystery of Everything. And if we think of the fastest speed we can think of, Joe, I think of uh, light speed, but uh, that, that's God's speed is light speed. And I guess anything else is dimmer, darker than that. <laughs> that's right, because God is light, as right. we know. The Bible makes no secret about that. So as we get darker in the spectrum, we're getting away from God, if you want to think of it mm. that way. And the Bible brings up darkness many times, many different examples from the Old Testament to the New. And we can really understand uh, what God's speed is all about and what it's saying when it uses the term darkness. And just mm. to remind people, God's speed is just nothing more than the spirit level, the parable level, the allegory level, metaphor level, however you wish to say it. It's that higher speed at which God is teaching, the way he thinks, the way he operates, and the way we should be learning from him because mm. everything is being broadcast 
at, at the parable level of God's speed. So even in the terms of uh, light and darkness, as you mentioned, we can learn how, what God is teaching. And darkness is all throughout the Bible. As you mentioned, that God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. It says in 1 John 1, 5. But what is darkness? Yeah, is that, I mean, we've talked about darkness before. Well, no, no, we talked about darkness. We talked about what man is. We talked about how man is earth. So my guess is, is, is man darkness or is it something it's else? It's all It's all related because the earth, as you know, is dark. Soil is dark. It's not a bright light like the sun is. Uh, so we, on the spirit level of God's speed, are considered the darkness. And the Bible uses the term darkness many times to refer to people. Here's... One scripture that may seem a little obscure to people, it's uh, buried in the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 2. This is out of the NIV version. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. Hmm. That's saying the same thing twice. Darkness covers the earth. Again, at God's Hmm. speed, we are the earth, so this is our darkness. It doesn't matter what kind of complexion you have. We, as physical beings, are darkness, and thick darkness is over what? The peoples, Mm. (laughs) because we are the peoples. The earth is the peoples. If you know how to read the poetry of the Bible, darkness is us. It's our flesh. We are the people. So Mm. darkness is the human condition in our fleshly state. Again, we're not spirit beings yet. We have the Spirit of God within us, and we're meant to get out of the flesh, but right now we have darkness... uh, of the earth. Here's another kind of obscure verse. Song of Songs, ver- chapter 1, verse 5. I am dark like the tents of Kedar. Now, people might say, hmm, what does that mean? I am dark like the tents of Kedar. Kedar is a word that means darkness. Ah. So the, the woman in this story, the bride, by the way, is, uh, is, is telling people that She's in the flesh, like we in the flesh Mm. now are dark like the tents, because we're all in a tent, we all realize this is an earthen tent, the earthen vessel that we're in, we're in the tents of darkness. We're covered with a tent. Our skin Mm. and flesh is our tent of darkness. So when you look up the word sometimes, it helps you get to that spirit level, the parable level. We're all dark like the tents of darkness. That's all it's saying. So... When we take this concept, we can go all over the Bible to find all kinds of fun stories dealing with darkness. For instance, three days of darkness in Egypt. It was one of the plagues on Egypt in in the Old Testament, and we know that uh, darkness represents the flesh. But why is it three days of darkness? Mm. Again, it goes back to the point of Hebrews 13.8. Yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Those are the three days. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And those three days represent the past, present, and future. Mm. If you are in the fleshly mindset and literally of the flesh, you are in darkness for three days. The opposite of that story, incidentally, is that there was light in Goshen. Why was there light in Goshen but Mm. uh, darkness uh, for three days in Egypt? Well, Goshen actually means something. It's a word, and it's a name, and it it actually means something. It means drawing near. Mm. So, the message at God's speed, at the parable level, the metaphor level, the spirit level, is that if we're drawing near to God, we have light in our dwellings. This is our dwelling place. (laughs) And if you're drawing near to God, you have light in your dwelling place. But Mm. if you're not drawing near to God, you are in darkness. Simple as that. Makes sense. All right. So there is that example in Egypt, but there's, there's, uh, there are more examples of this. For example, three days and three nights in the, in the grave, three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the whale, all these things. So they're all... Well, there's one more point about Egypt, by the way. The Bible says it was a darkness that could be felt. And yeah, I, just, I just want to point that out. It's literally a darkness that can be felt because when you feel your skin, your flesh, you are feeling the darkness that can be felt. Mm. That's why that phrase is in the Bible. The, God is using every tool in the box, every possible way of phrasing something so that you know what he's talking about if you're paying attention. Jesus, even in the New Testament, mentions bind him, you know, somebody who's disobedient, take him away from the king and bind him in outer darkness. Outer darkness is this, bind him in the flesh because he's going to stay in the flesh in the body mm. of the beast that we talked about. 
There's more than one resurrection coming, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of condemnation or the resurrection of judgment, as some Bibles put it, where people are going to be back in the flesh, resurrected, and that's being bound in outer darkness. So hmm. this is the darkness that can be felt. These are not scary terms. God is just saying the same thing over and over using different words. And so come out, so when we come out of darkness or to come out of Babylon or any of these... Come out of Egypt. Come out of it's, Egypt. It's all saying the same thing. We are meant to come out of the darkness the dark place of misery, which is Egypt. Come out of Sodom, which is the burning place, the flaming place. Come out of her, my people. You see all these mm. phrases in the Bible because the Bible is verse, basically a, a book about spirit versus flesh. God is a spirit. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, I believe, God is spirit or a spirit. He's a spirit being. We are not a spirit being yet. Mm. We're meant to be, but we are currently in the body of a beast, the body of flesh, and we see examples of that in the Bible. Hmm. Now, when we, we just mentioned Sodom, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, well, we, we talked about that before, what Sodom means. Uh, after that point in the Bible, we get into uh, the Israelites, of course, and then uh, they don't have an easy trek into the land. They have to encounter all of these other peoples, all of these other uh, Amorites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and all these, all these different um, names. So is there anything to these names at the God speed of understanding? Absolutely. I, you know, people read the Bible sometimes, again, just as a historical book, and they say, oh, well, the Israelites did battle with... Uh, well, here's a, a fun verse, Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 4. It mentions a whole bunch of these pagan people with hard-to-pronounce names, but we're going <laughs> to give it a try here. Uh, when the Lord God, your God, brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. So... God has a problem with these people, not just because their names are hard to pronounce, but because they, they're not following God. But at God's speed, the parable level, remember, Jesus only spoke in parables. So this is not just a physical, historical event. It's teaching us something else. We have to look at the names of these people because they mean things. Mm. And I looked it up. I went to all the, the books out there with the Hebrew meanings, and uh, I found out the meanings. And we'll just tell you what they are right now. Hittites means terrible ones or fearful people. Girgashites means dwellers in a clayish soil. Amorites means talkers. Canaanites means merchants or global traders. Hivites, the tent people or villagers in tents. And Jebusites means people who tread down. So yeah. these are people, not just thousands of years ago, these are people we deal with every day. We deal with people who tread us down all the time, mm. whether it's on your job or in your family or your neighbors who are just barking at you all the time. Those are Jebusites because they're treading you down. Hittites, terrible ones. Just, you know, terrible people in life are <laughs> fearful people. Girgashites means uh, dwellers in a clayish soil, so it's people who are more interested in dwelling in their clayish soil. Again, we are made mm. of the clayish soil. Amorites means talkers. They're, I'm sure you know people who talk too much. They're just gabbing all the time, and they're getting online, and they're tweeting or whatever they're mm -hmm. doing out there. They're just talkers, and they complain too much. They're not learning about God and being peacefully quiet. They're just overly talking. Hivites, villagers in tents, Again, we are people in, a, in an earthly tent right now. The Bible talks about that term many times. So they're more interested in staying in their current tent, the flesh, mm. rather than getting out and being part uh, of, of God's family in the spirit. So there's a reason why God has mentioned all these uh, names of all these people. It's not just ancient people from the past. It's people that you work with, deal with, in your own neighborhoods and families all the time. People have all these characteristics. So again, God is using every possible way to broadcast his message that, hey, I'm here and I'm the silent partner here uh, of what's going on and I'm the reason you're here and I'm your destiny of where you're going. All you have to do is pay attention. There's a psalm, I think it's Psalm 94, 6. It actually says in one translation, pay attention, you stupid people. Fools, when will you be wise? And other translations say, uh, take heed, you brutish among the people. 
because we're like a big bunch of brute animals not paying attention. He calls us stupid people. Like, mm. pay attention. I'm here. I'm giving you the keys to eternal life. All you have to do is pay attention and, and be wise. So mm. it's, it's just astonishing when you translate the names that we think are tough to pronounce, and they are tough to pronounce, but still, look up the meanings. I've done it for you in Reaching God's Speed, so you don't even have to look them up. <laughs> but even, even names like David and Goliath and the Philistines, mm. it's broadcasting a message at God's speed. I'm sure you know what David means, right? For refresh me. Off the it, top it, of my head, it, I don't. It means beloved. Yeah. And okay. uh, millions of Christians know that, and they love the story of David because he's such a popular character. And it's one of the first stories of David and Goliath that we uh, teach the kids in classes. Uh, everybody knows how David defeated Goliath, but Goliath actually means something. It means exile, mm. because he's living in exile, and he represents anyone who was rebelling against God in exile. And Philistines actually mean something. It means dust rollers, people rolling in the dust. We know what the dust is. Mm. It's the flesh. It's, it's this body. It comes from a Hebrew verb, palash, which means to agonize loudly and burrow in the ground. And that's what we're all spiritually doing here. We're in the ground mm. and we're agonizing uh, loudly. So it, it really means dust roller. So when you have the story of David killing the giant in exile, you have the beloved people of God, whether it's Jesus himself or any of his followers, taking on the champion of the dust rollers, <laughs> the people in the flesh, to defeat them mm -hmm. uh, and, and score victory. So there is a meaning to the David and Goliath story besides a shepherd boy taking a stone out of his bag and, and sinking it into the giant's head and he collapses. We are the beloved ones of God. God calls us his beloved. You see mm. that term all throughout the Bible. We're the beloved ones. We're taking on the giants out there who are in exile. Why are they in exile? Because they're rebelling against God. If you're not rebelling against God, you're part of his flock. But you're in exile if, if, you, got, if you have a problem with him mm. and are fighting against God, which, which no one should ever do. But again, it's getting out of the flesh. We don't want to be the dust rollers that uh, the Philistines are, and that's why uh, the story of David and Goliath has such extra meaning at uh, Godspeed. And even more than that, I'm, I, as I'm hearing you say this, I'm thinking that there's a commonality between the story of David and Goliath and the Israelites. So David, in the way he kills Goliath, where does the stone land on Goliath? In his forehead. Right. Right We've talked mind. about that previously, how the forehead, so when we speak of revelation, the mark in the forehead and the hand, that what you think and that what you do. So in a sense, David is slaying the thoughts of the carnal mind and defeating it once and for all. Absolutely. Even though it is a giant. <laughs> yes, and you've just come up to God's speed because you're connecting the dots and thinking on the spirit level, the parable level. Even the stones that he used, he didn't take uh, rough stones, he took the polished stones, the smooth stones out of his bag mm. because Jesus uses the polished weapons. We become polished with God. You know, John the Baptist said, make the rough places smooth. Mm. We become smooth and polished with God like a polished gem uh, that can that mm. becomes the rock that, that defeats the giant. So we are being polished by God, if you want to think of it that way, the smooth stone. So it wasn't just some rough stone that he yeah. took out of his bag. God has all of us as this, again, he calls Peter a stone, a rock, mm -hmm. as, as an example, because it represents all people. We are all the rocks in the bag, and we become the smooth stones when mm. we allow God to shape us. We have to be malleable, allow our character to be formed properly and smoothed out so we're no longer the rough stones. And there again, what does that? What, what smooths the stones? It's the stream. It's the water. And the waters, waters, what does water represent? It's spirit the of spirit. God. So let his spirit wash over us, refine clean us, up. us, clean us up, and even David, as he, I am assuming he had to, I mean, this all seems like a stretch, but maybe not really when we're reaching, like you said, God's speed, is where would he have to go to get those smooth stones out of the stream? He would have to probably wade into the stream. So there again, he's almost like doing a mikvah. He's cleaning himself up, getting the smooth stones. Only then is he able to slay the giant. Right. And, wow. the, gi and the giant represents the devil, if you want to think of it that, that way, the most evil one who's laughing at all of us because we're, we think we're little pipsqueaks mm -hmm. in, in comparison. But we, the, the, the battle has already been won. When you have the Spirit of God 
We have to realize the battle is already won. You just have to have the willingness mm -hmm. to fight the good fight. You see that phrase in the New Testament, fight the good fight of faith. We have the armor. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the belt of truth. So we have the weapons to fight this war. We just have to use mm -hmm. them. We don't have to freak out and say, oh, these problems are, are too big for me. I can't take it. They're, the world is surrounding me. Mm -hmm. I'm going down. The battle has already been won. We just have to realize it's a spiritual war that we're in, and we can win this fight when we just allow God, God's presence, and his weapons of warfare to take over. And speaking of weapons of warfare, that story even has more to it. So remember when he goes to see Goliath, number one, all the Israelites are afraid of him. Well, there is the wrong mindset, the wrong thought. So David needed to slay that thought for the sake of his brothers in the Israelite. Secondly, what does Saul try to do? He tries to give David the armor. Well, you're not gonna accept any f armor, although it looks strong because it's from a place of fear and it's physical, where David says, I don't need that. All I need to do is go down to the stream, down to the spirit, grab what's really gonna kill this giant and that's, it, that's the way it's gonna be won. The Israelites too, when I think of that story that you gave, so the Israelites, they defeat all of these enemies. So they are thrown into the wilderness. They have to defeat the enemies in order to make it to the promised land. So what are we? We are thrown into a wilderness to defeat enemies on our way to a promised land. It's amazing how quickly you've come up to God's feet. I mean, I'm astonished. because <laughs> well, you're, you're standing here. You're the author of the book. I mean, that's... <laughs> but, but that's exactly what it is because everything is declaring the end from the beginning. Mm. The end of the story is we get salvation. But in the meantime, we have to fight the war. We have to be willing to fight the war. God does not want cowards. It says in the book of Revelation, like the first people that won't make it into the kingdom are cowards or the fearful. He doesn't want you to be cowardly or fearful because we have nothing to fear because the devil has already been defeated mm. because God has defeated defeated him. And we, we let the Spirit of God in our minds and in our hearts, that those are the weapons of warfare to use. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Mm. So we just have to get it in our mind that no matter what problem we're facing, resist it. Have the Spirit of God in you, in your mind, and the devil always backs down. Even when Jesus was being arrested, mm. you know, uh, they said, you know, which one's Jesus? I, I am he. And they all fell backward down to the mm. ground. It's, again, it's painting the picture at God's speed at the parable level of when you confront the wicked ones, they fall. Right. And it all comes from a place of thought, doesn't it? Where we, are, we fear. Uh, that, that makes total sense. So if, if we come up against something that we don't know how to battle, our first reaction is to our, our emotions get affected. So we fear. So there, okay, now our mind's toast. We've, <laughs> we've blown, that one, <laughs> blown that option. And then what's the next thing we do? Out of fear, we make irrational decisions and we do something. So there again, there's the hand. So we think and then we do all out of, pla out of a place of fear and it's completely the wrong option to choose. It's the mark of the beast. The Bible mm -hmm. says over and over, be strong and of good courage. There you go. Fear not. Be afraid not. All these phrases are in the Bible countless times because we should have no fear. It was when they were scoping out the promised land, uh, the two spies, uh, it was more than two going in, by the way, but they were the only two that came back with a positive report because they didn't fear. They said, hey, we, the land right. is good. We can take this land. But everybody else was like, oh, no, there's giants in the land. We can't, we can't take the land because that was fear. That's the flesh. Mm. And we got to get out of this carnal mindset. That's so funny that who, I never thought of that before, the correlation now that we mentioned it, the story of David and Goliath and then the Israelites going in. Facing the giants. Facing the giants on both fronts. Exactly. One feared, one didn't, one... one uh, I defeated the giant and the others, well, they had 40 years of learning a lesson. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the Bible is very consistent. He just uses different words, different people, different phraseology mm. to say the same message over and over. Well, I love it. Uh, let's come back to that. Okay, so we're going to take a break. We're going to be right back. As you can tell, I'm enjoying this. I hope you are too, and I hope that the wheels are turning in your head as well. Lights are coming on because we are doing, we are reaching Godspeed with Joe Kovacs. You can get it at, again, reachinggodspeed.com. I want to thank you for bringing Joe here because I'm certainly enjoying myself, and I hope you are too. Uh, you brought him here. Your donations brought him here. Uh, folks in the past donated so that Joe could come here. We could have the beautiful facilities we have here. If you'd like to see others continue to watch this into the
the future. We need you to help now. We need you to have the thoughts and the actions of one who is not fearing, as Joe says, and going forth and pushing the gospel forward. So will you help us do that? You can do that through a donation. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. We'll be right back. I have a question for you right from the back of this book. Is it possible we've all been missing something extraordinary in life? And the answer is surprising. And what we're about to learn will wake us up to a reality most of us never knew existed. We're talking about reaching God's speed with Dr. Well, it seemed like a doctor to me. Let's let's give you that honorary title, Joe Kovacs. I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV. <laughs> But you do play well when you're writing books. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so we've talked about all kinds of fascinating things. We've talked about the Israelites. We've talked about David and Goliath and how all those stories are interrelated and they're trying to teach us something above the story. Yes, the stories happen. They're not fake. They did happen. But they teach us something after the fact. They happened and we are to learn from that and look at a higher level. And that's what you call God speed. Right. And again, it's nothing more than the spirit level, the parable level, the metaphoric level, the figurative level. Yeah. People use different words, the symbolic level. But it's just, again, Jesus spoke only in parables and without a parable, he did not speak. So even in his actions, and as you know, actions speak louder than words sometimes. The, uh, the actions are teaching a message, an additional message, as well as the historical, physical message. Yes, you're right. Everything in the Bible did happen as, as it's told on the, on the physical level. But it is broadcasting an additional message that usually has something to do with the end of the story. Because God declares the end from the beginning, as it says in Isaiah 46.10. Mm -hmm. Always have those key verses I mentioned in the first program running through the back of your mind. And it will make the transition to God's speed or the parable level so much easier as we've seen even you do in the course of these programs. You're thinking, oh, this means this, this means this. It's the, all the lights are lighting up mm -hmm. and that's how it's supposed to be. The lights are meant to be turned on. You've heard the expression, oh, the lights are on but nobody's home. Well, we're supposed <laughs> to have the lights on and somebody home in us because you can understand virtually everything because God's presence is in everything. He says Christ fills all in all. He mm. fills everything everywhere with his presence so there's nothing that that God is not in mm, indeed and, and and like the Bible says we need to become like children we not we should not be thinking so highly of ourselves we know it all he will make wise the simple taking all of that we have to just forget about ourselves and just go 
what does this mean, God? And just be open to like a little, like a little kid going, what, why is the sky blue? And it's as simple as that, and he reveals stuff to us. And unfortunately, some folks are not willing to do that, to hum- humble themselves, and, and Yehovah will, will teach us things. But uh, I'm about to learn something from you here about a second Passover you've talked about. Now, we know about the second Passover. So it, when we think of end time events, uh, quite often my mind goes to uh, the fall feasts of the Lord. So the things in the, in the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. So we're thinking, you know, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, all those type of things. And of course, Sukkot and all that. But you have a relation to it regarding Passover and specifically the second Passover. So could you enlighten me on that? Right, I'm sure most of your viewers here are familiar with the first Passover, which takes place on the 14th day of the first month of the year. But the Bible specifically mentions a second Passover, which takes place on the 14th day of the second month. And we're going to just read a brief passage which explains it in Numbers chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. It's very brief. This is out of the New King James Version. If any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. On the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. Then it goes into the uh, eating on unleavened bread and all the uh, customs of, of, of the first Passover. So why is the Bible mentioning a corpse or far away on a journey? You might say, hmm, I'm not quite sure. It has little to do with actually physically, you know, if you touch a dead body or... Uh, I'll, I'll explain that right now. We are the corpses at God's speed. We are all in a body of death. Paul says that in the New Testament. This is the body of death. What a wretched man I am. Who can save me from this body of death? We are the walking dead. We're all in a corpse right now. So if we are all basically unclean right now, if we are not following God. So when it says far away on a journey, it is saying the same thing in using different words. We're not close to God. We're far away from God. We're, mm. we're journeying, we're wandering away in the land of Nod. Nod means wandering, by the way. So we are all far away from God on a journey if we are not being close to God. That's why these people are unclean. If you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or far away. So mm. we're all in dead bodies here in the flesh making us unclean. We're all far away from God on a journey if we're not obeying him. So the people keeping the first Passover are considered clean. That is a projection of the first resurrection, the first Passover. But in the next time, the next month, on the same day, by the way, in the second month is the second time. A time is a month, is a year, is a second. Mm. All times are equal in the Bible when it comes to God's speed or the parable level. A time is a time is a time. So the second time is the second round. That is the second resurrection when people who are unclean, all those unbelievers out there and people who reject God for whatever reason or are simply confused, they're considered unclean because they're far away from God right now. They're on a journey Mm. somewhere else or they're staying in their dead body in their walking dead zombie corpse that everyone is. So it's basically saying, if you don't make it in the first round, there is that chance in the next month in the next time, in the next round, in the next resurrection, the second resurrection in the second month mm. that points to uh, the, the end time for everyone else. Not just, again, not the believers who make it in the first round, it's the believers who make it in the second round. Mm. It's kind of like the um, Thomas, doubting Thomas. He's the twin because twin means number two. And he wasn't there in the first round. Why? Because he was an unbeliever when, when uh, Jesus showed up and mm. the disciples were there but the doubter wasn't. The doubter represents everybody in this world who is doubting God for whatever reason. But he was present in the second round when he saw and finally believed because God is coming back for the unbelievers too in the second round, in the second time. A week later is like the second month. In the second week, in the second month, it's second resurrection. His name means twin, number two, because it's pointing to the second resurrection. God is using the same terms to, or different terms, to promote the same message. He's the twin because mm. it points to the second resurrection. And the doubters, when they finally see members of the God family and people who made it in the first round, in the first resurrection, they're going to say, 
oh my gosh, this was real. All this stuff that I've heard about all my life, but either didn't get with the program or just outright rejected, it's real, and now I'm going to believe. Seeing is believing. I'm sure you've heard that phrase, and, and people, when they finally see members of God's family, people they knew, people in this program who are going to make it there in the first round, all, all those friends and enemies that have been mocking you and persecuting you your whole life, they're finally going to see you and as Revelation says, they're going to come down and bow down and <laughs> right in front of you because, mm -hmm. because they realize you've made it to the spirit level as a child of God, and they're stuck back in the body of the beast. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not unlike what Thomas did. He fell before Yeshua once he put his hands in, in the handprints and the, and the feet and said, my Lord and my God, and he just fell and realized, right. and, then, and Yeshua accepted him. Mm -hmm. and, and notice he said, well, you uh, believe now because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen and believed. You know, mm. I've never seen God in my personal life. He's never appeared to right. me and said, yeah. hey, Joe, I want you to go do this. But we can see evidence of God in everything. And that's the thing. Mm. We are seeing the unseen. And when you understand the parable level, the spirit level, when you get to God's speed, you will see the presence of God in everything. And that's what makes it so easy because you see God's presence everywhere. And it's not a difficult thing. Well, like we mentioned trees before, <laughs> you see a tree, you realize it represents people. Water mm. can represent people. Water can represent the spirit of God himself. Rocks can represent God and people. As we see, Jesus is called the rock and Peter's a rock as well. Interesting stuff. Okay, so this, so we get into Passover, and, and related to Passover is something that, uh, of course, everyone, when they first come into uh, this walk, they question, well, how do you get three days and three nights out of Good Friday to Easter Sunday? <laughs> and of course, we, we, we've spent a lot of time explaining that, that yes, Yeshua died on, on a Wednesday. That's, that's the clue, and people are getting the preparation day wrong. And so that, that's how you get the correct uh, term in our chronology out of that, and Michael talks at length about that. Uh, but it's all related to something Michael also calls uh, the sign of Jonah. And that's the one sign of authenticity that Yeshua gave of, his, uh, of, his, of who he was. And so we wanna talk about Jonah a little bit. And again, here comes this thing we talked about in the beginning of uh, today's episode was when we talked about darkness, three days. So three days, and darkness, how does this relate to Jonah and, and his story? Well, Jonah, again, is one of those children's stories that it's one of the first that we explain to our children about getting them interested in the Bible. He's a man running away from God when God told him to specifically to do something. So right away, we know he represents all of us because we're at some point in our lives running away from God when he wants us to do the other thing. But he also famously, most famously, is dwelling in the body of a beast, a big beast, as a matter of fact, a big fish. Why mm. is that? It's because, as we said before, mankind is dwelling in the body of a beast. We are all in the image of God, but currently we're like the animals. And mm. we've read many scriptures before us that you know, mankind is like the beasts that perish. But we are all a person with a mind dwelling in the body of a beast. And again, it mentions you know, three days uh, and, and three nights there, and that points back to Hebrews 13, 8. Yesterday, mm -hmm. today, and tomorrow. Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same. But if we are rebelling against God, going away from Him, running in the other direction, we're going to stay in the body of the beast. So I, mm -hmm. it's just brilliant how Jesus brought, you know, His only sign of authenticity back to Jonah. And if we read some of the thoughts going through Jonah's mind while he's in the body of the beast, it's going to be quite revealing to you because we all have these thoughts. It says in Jonah 2, 2, I called to the Lord in my distress, and He answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. Verse 5 says, The waters surrounded me. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Verse 6, I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. Well, mm. based on what we've already talked about, on what these symbols mean, we're all inside Sheol right now. This is the land of the walking dead. Sheol is, is the pit, the place of the dead. And we're all 
crying to God for help from deep inside this spiritual pit. So, you so the fish is the, is the earth, or our, our human existence. Is that what Correct, our, okay. our existence here in this place where... Or the whale, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, the, the big fish is, is the body of the beast, if you want to think of it that way. The deep closed around me and weeds were wrapped around my head. Well, what, are, what do weeds represent in the Bible? The Bible actually gives us the answer. In the New Testament, Jesus, as a matter of fact, told us what the weeds, weeds are. The weeds and the tares? Is that what we're thinking, going to with? The weeds are the children of the evil one. Exactly okay. right. You're, you're separating... Uh, or the uh, wheat and the tares. The, the, the weed, tares the, are the weeds. Yes, so, yeah. yes but uh, tares are, are weeds. And yes, you're separating the good from the bad. Weeds are the children of the evil one, Matthew 13, 38. Hmm. So when he says weeds were wrapped around my head, it's talking about evil people who are wrapping around your mind all the time, mm. all through childhood and puberty and adulthood. And, you know, some people are never able to shake the weeds out of their mind. They're, they're just growing in there and they can never come to God because the weeds are wrapping around your head. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates lock shut forever. Hmm. What is the earth? We keep talking about this. This is the earth. Our bodies are the earth because we're made of the dust of the earth. We're locked in. It's, we're like in, in prison now. We can't travel to the other side of the universe, the seen or unseen universe. God can do that because he's a spirit being. He's not shackled in this physical, fleshly prison that we're in. Hmm. So the gates being locked shut, imprisoned in the earth, that again ref refers to the human body. But, oh Lord, my God, you snatched me from the jaws of death. This is a picture of resurrection. And again, as we know in the story of Jonah, he's taken out of the body of the beast mm -hmm. and is then able to preach to other people who finally come around. That city of Nineveh is like the only mass repentance place in the Bible mentioned. You have individual repentance uh, among people, but the whole city of Nineveh, who were unbelievers, they repented mm -hmm. when they saw somebody who was raised from death, raised from the body of the beast, who was no longer shackled in the body of the beast, giving them God's message, and that's when the mass repentance comes. It's the second resurrection. Only the few are being called right now, as Jesus mm -hmm. said. So it's, it's just a fascinating picture when you, when you put, connect all the dots. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot because I don't know if you've thought about this. Maybe we could just talk about it and, and think about it. Is after that happens in Nineveh, uh, Jonah goes and because they all, uh, all the people believed, he pouts about it. All of a sudden, he's jealous about it or something, and he goes and he goes under the shade of a, of a, of a, a tree that grows up over Etham, and that's kind of the end of the story. We're left with this, where Jonah's all miffed, and yet the people in Nineveh have been saved. And what are we to make of this? I never know what to make of the end of the story. It, I, I think it's a message that we shouldn't be miffed about it because. If you know that God's going to eventually save everybody, you're, there might be the point that coming through your mind of, well, why am I bothering doing this? God is going to save most people in the end anyway. But we still have to do what God tells us. We shouldn't be miffed. He's, God says at the end of that story, you know, there's a lot of people in that town and much cattle. He even points out cattle because, again, cattle are people. Mm -hmm. uh, the beasts are the people right. uh, at, at God's speed because we want everyone to be saved. Love your enemy, not just your friends. We want all those people who treat you like dirt and persecute you and, and want to cancel you off the internet or whatever. We want those people to have life too. So don't be miffed about it. Yes, it's hard and it's tough and we must suffer many things to enter the kingdom of God, the New Testament says. So we have to put up with all these sufferings and, and go through this. And sometimes we have to do even what, you know, God tells us to do something and we don't want to do it, but sometimes he's going to make you do it. And he's going to make you suffer uh, a lot of things. And, yeah. you know, he, here you have a man being digested in the body of a beast. If you think of it this way, we're actually being digested. We're withering away, as you know, yeah. and in, into nothingness, into a grave. And uh, mm. the Bible has the example of the watery grave there for, for Jonah, and he cries to God from the depths of the pit. We're in the deep right now, the abyss, the pit, Sheol, however you want to phrase it. We're in the low place. God is in the high place called mm. heaven. <laughs> we're in the low place. But we're meant to get out of the low place and join God uh, in, in the heavens. So again, it's, it's like encountering all those people in our lives that, that are coming against us. They're the weeds that are wrapped around our heads. And even if it's God telling us, 
uh, he wants us to do something like start a business. It doesn't have to be something negative that <laughs> takes us through these challenges. Start a business, do this, do that, and we have to make it. Yeah, we think, okay, yeah, okay, I'll do it, but then we have to make it through the Jebby sites, the... The headaches, <laughs> the amorites, so. Every, the, the talkers. The everybody in our way telling us, oh, you won't make it. You shouldn't be doing that. Did, did God really want you to start that, really? They tread you down. Yeah. And that's, there's a reason why uh, the Bible uses the word Jebusites is because there are people who tread on you. Mm. Even uh, one of the early slogans of America it was, don't tread on me. Mm, because right. we don't want to be tread on. Nobody wants to be tread on. But other people... You know, you feel trodden down all the time because they're banging on you, and, on, on your spirit, and uh, we want to be free and at peace and at liberty and not being uh, tread down on, so. Yep. And that means being a light, right? And that's the last thing we wanted to get into today. Today we started with the, the concept of darkness, and we want to end with light. And so the first thing God created was he said, let there be light, and we are to be children of the light. So what, what can we learn on a higher level, on God's level, about light? Let's read the Bible verse from Genesis 1. This is right at the beginning of the Bible, verses 2 through 4. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. This is not just talking about the beginning of the physical universe. Yes, it's talking about that on the physical level, but don't forget God declares the end from the beginning. And we're right here at the beginning of the Bible now. Hmm. And it's declaring the end of the story. What is the end of the story? He's going to be moving upon the face of the waters. Waters can represent people in the Bible. The waters actually do represent people in the book of Revelation. God spoke with a voice of many waters, by the way. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So he's taking what was dark the darkness of the flesh, and transforming it mm. into light beings, spirit beings, divine children on the immortal plane where we're no longer the darkness of human mm. flesh. We are going to be light, and we're called good because only God is good, and we're going to be on the God level as one of God's very own children. So mm. the end of the Bible is telling us that we're the children of light. We're no longer in the darkness of the flesh. We're children of the light and of the day. And that's how we get the end from the beginning. Well, Joe, I think we have more to talk about, but I think let's do a bonus. Let's okay. do a bonus, and we'll come back and do that. But for right now, uh, our time's up, so we need to go. But in the meantime, I want to encourage folks, get this book, reachinggodspeed.com by Joe Kovacs. Beautiful thing. We're talking about it for the last four weeks. There's lots more that we haven't talked about here, so get the book. Uh, support what Joe's doing. Uh, a lot of folks who are being the weeds in his life have trodden him down. We need to bring him back up. So go to reachinggodspeed.com. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for bringing Shabbat Night Live to lots of people other than yourself and to many homes around the world. Thank you. Your donations make it possible. All right. So we will see you next week for another edition of Shabbat Night Live. Until then, Shavuot Tov. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon. And I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.